Hello and welcome back to the Apprentice One to One podcast. It is me, your host, Mark, and I am joined by another member of the Apprentice One to One family in Matt Telford. How are you, Matt? I'm very good, Mark. Thank you very much for having me back. No, it's a pleasure. I think the last one you did on the podcast went down really well because you're going through your training as an apprentice and you are also managing the Facebook group for us um, here and there when you can in and around the day job. And you've got a bit of experience around the training space before that. So that fits very well with today's podcast. We're going to dive into your progress and what you've been up to. And towards the end, we are going to cover off option skills as well. I've been getting a lot of questions about that over on Instagram and LinkedIn. So I do want to mention it in this episode. But before we get into all of that, how's things going for you, Matt, at the minute? It's going really well, actually, Mark. Um, like we talked about on the last one, I think... Um, it was from that. I had an email from a local spark to say, do you want to come and do some experience? Um, and within a couple of weeks, we started talking about whether I should go uh, self-employed or as an apprentice. So I actually set up as a self-employed subby to work as an improver. And within, I think, probably three months, um, he managed to offer me an apprenticeship. So I'm now kind of technically an apprentice, but it's not fully an apprentice until September so I am registered with the local college um, and we're doing with a group of us there's about eight of us and we're doing a kind of a feed into September so we're only doing one Monday uh, a month at the minute um, just getting ready for September so doing a little bit of basics but yeah loving the work um, we're doing everything we're doing industrial we're doing commercial we're doing domestics so anything from you know I think um, I put a fan in someone's bathroom which is horrible domestic stuff um, and pulling in big, you know, big armoured cables in, in factories. Uh, yeah, everything. We really do the whole, and it's just two of us. So it's really quite close-knit, quite tight. Um, I get to do quite a bit on my own, uh, but, you know, always there, someone to sort of ask about, show me how to do stuff. It's been really, really good. Um, and I think that's basically come from that one podcast. Someone watched it. Um, and like I said, I work on the Facebook group as well. And, and I've done what they do, you know, I've, I've sent emails and phone calls and stuff. And sometimes it just takes a lucky break. So, you know, keep plodding on anyone who's looking for a placement. Click pod, keep plodding on, keep talking to people, keep asking for, for work experience. Don't ask for an apprenticeship. Apprenticeships are really difficult to give. Ask for a day, a week, a weekend. You know, it's Easter week for anyone, who's, uh, Easter holidays for anyone who's at school and college get down your wholesalers and say, mate, you know, can I have a couple of hours? Can I have a day? Just just let me have a go. And then if you show you're willing, show you're capable, they're much more likely to start talking about the next steps. Yeah, it's really difficult for someone, anyone, small companies or big companies, to fork out four years worth of their time. Whereas it's a lot easier. And I'm sure you, you'd probably appreciate this being a business owner yourself. It's easier for someone to say, Mark, can I come and do a day? And it is to say, can I have four years? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you was good enough to come out and work with us on a job for a few days as well. And and we've had um, Dan Bryant recently come along and spend a bit of time with us. So we do try and do that in our business where we will help people out with a bit of experience. And we're kind of maxed out in what we can employ ourselves. So it's a, it's a good way of just getting a bit of experience out on site. But equally, in your case, it's led on to something um, bigger and, and shout out to whoever that listener was I don't want to I don't want to name them unless you wanted to but full credit to them as well for wanting to take that step and go on that journey um, I think it's brilliant and it's working out really well for you from the sounds of it yeah it is it's really good and um, I will shout out it's Adam from uh, White Swan Electrical so anyone in Staffordshire Derbyshire Nottinghamshire Cheshire or anywhere else because we'll go anywhere who wants some you know industrial commercial stuff give us a shout White Swan Electrical Good stuff. I mean, fair play to Adam as well for sitting through my podcasts over the years. If he's sat listening to more than one, good on him. But that's really good in terms of the employment side. It sounds like you're getting really good experience. They're the best apprenticeships if you can get them where you are in a varied work environment. You can cover off your portfolio and build up, you know, for the future. It's a really good way to go into a full time career as an electrician. How was the the college aspect? I know you said you're on kind of a, a bit of a waiting stage at the minute for September. And I think there's a few other people I'm speaking to at the minute in a similar circumstance. So they're waiting for their apprenticeships to properly start. Is that going okay? Yeah, it's it's going all right. I think um, we've spoken about this before. I don't know if we've spoken about it on the podcast or just between ourselves. That I think 
further education is is in a real bit of a doldrums at the minute where they're lacking staff. Um, the staff seem to be either lacking commercial experience but are really good teachers or really good commercial experience or you know, maybe lacking a bit of that delivery aspect um, or, or sometimes just maybe some weirdly lacking a bit of both. So um, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I've, I've been a technical trainer. I've worked around apprenticeships for a long time. You know, I've worked with, with delivering technical education. So maybe I'm just very difficult to please, but I think most of the places I've been around with colleges could, could do with some, some improvement. Uh, and, and I, I get a load of, of emails from job agencies and stuff. And weirdly, the college I'm at is actually now advertising for a, a temporary um, lecturer assessor at school installation for, you know, till the end of the summer term. So it's a bit worrying when you're going to that college and you know at the same time that they're possibly struggling with staff. Mm. But then, you know, you talk to other people and you can see that the starting salaries they want people to go in on um, you know the the maybe the work they want to do, the hours they want to deliver. Um, it's not necessarily going to pull a time served, you know, experience spark from the tools to go and deal with, you know, maybe unruly kids who don't want to be there, which are making it difficult for the kids and the adults that do want to be there. You know, it's a really difficult thing as well. I mean, I find that difficult that you know we'll be in on one of our Mondays and we'll start. And then, you know, it seems that once we've started, half the group are just asking about when we want to go home. And I'm sitting there going, I want to learn. I don't mind being here till five o'clock because that's when I would be working to. So keep me here for nine o'clock. You know, my boss is paying me for eight hours. I expect to be at college for eight hours. And I expect to be given seven to seven and a half hours of good learning out of that. Not seven, you know, not, uh, what was nine till maybe six hours and then take off lunches and breaks, maybe only four or five hours. I think that's when it starts going wrong. I think that's my biggest concerns with FE, um, especially when, you know, I know how much that college is being given between my boss's contribution and the government contribution. I know that that's getting them, you know, for a standard rent about £20,000. Not cover four years, three or four years, but 20 grand over a class of, um, and there's eight of us in this get to know you, but there'll probably be 15, 20 in a full year. That's a lot of money to not be delivering what I expect an apprentice, and I'm sure what my boss would expect as someone who is giving me eight hours off work to go and be taught if I'm not being taught. And that's it's terrible. It's it's not good. And and I've had the same experience with Matty and Nathan, who you've met in my business, and they go to college, or Matthew did way back when, and they were having four or five hour days. And, you know, young people, they think that's great. They're getting an early finish, but you're dead right. That's not what's been paid for either by the government or the employers. And there's people like yourself who want to be getting value from that as well. So, you know, that, that should stop. We see the stuff with the assessors as well, not coming out often enough to do their inspections i think matty was three years waiting for his and we see nathan's once in a blue moon and when he comes it's just to get me to sign a bit of paper there's so many breakdowns in all of that and as you've said with that 20 i think it's actually up to twenty seven thousand pound craig said before with certain elements of funding around the english and maths that couldn't be obtained as well for lots of the, the students on those routes so it's not a small change is it and yeah it does seem to be going a bit misplaced i guess yeah and I was quite surprised when our assessor said, because he's the bloke who's actually doing some teaching at the minute, um, I think he said he only actually has to come out and visit us twice across the whole apprenticeship. Wow. Um, it's two units. So it might be it might be two units twice. So it might be four visits over the whole thing. But I've, I've assessed motor vehicle at level two and level three on light and heavy. And I can tell you, I do a lot more visits on that to go out and get, get the apprentices ready to do the assessing to pick up the units and, and yeah, two visits, two to four visits from an assessor across a four year period that's supposed to prove I'm competent and capable to then go and do, you know, the AM2S mm. in three or four years, I think is is interesting. To, so to put that level of 
um, an onus on to the employer to do more of the training, which admittedly they should, 20% off the job, that's the way the apprenticeship goes and that's the way the college goes. And they don't even deliver 20% because of holidays and the rest of it. But what's the assessor's job? You know, mm. really, 22 visits, two or four visits across four years. What are they going to do in those, in those two visits? We are supposed to be getting eight to 12 weeks, supposed to be getting progress visits from like the apprentice manager. I don't think they're they're technical. They're just, you know, like you said, how's it going? Sign this paper. Is your insurance up to date? You know, are you still talking to each other? Are you still doing what you should do? So on and so on. But it's not that, right then, Matt, show me how you would strip an SWA. Show me how you do this. Are you happy? How, you know, what are you looking at? What do you need to do? What are you going to do in the next, you know, six weeks? I, I think it's it's worrying now that I'm this side of it. And I... I know I said, I think on the last thing, and I said on Instagram at some point, I really should start properly recording my progress. And I think I probably should start doing that warts and all and just say, you know, this is the bad stuff as well as the good stuff. You see too many people going, yeah, it's great to be an apprentice. And it is, but you also see the fail rates. I think, you know, if you look at some of the statistics, the pass rate for AM2 and AM2S on the electrical, last time I looked was something around, 30%, 32%. Sounds about right. I think that's what it tracks at generally. That's shocking. That is shocking. How can any college, any assessor, any employer not look at that and go, Where where's my 20 grand gone? Why why am I sending these people back? I mean, you know, is it the employer saying I just want him to get through? Is it the employer not giving them the range of jobs? Is it the college saying um, yeah, 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 you'll be fine, you'll be fine, don't worry about it. You know, where is there? And I think, we'll, you know, like you said, we'll talk about this and some of this stuff with some of the big problems we've got in industry at the minute later on. But I think that's something that, you know, 30% pass rate is mm. awful. It's not good, is it? And like you said, we'll, we'll come to more, towards more of that at the end as um, the bad news. But you did suggest some good news before we came on air with this, Matt, and I think um, that's an important one to share. I'll let you have the pleasure of that because it is good news. I, th I think it is. And I was talking to, there's, there's a little apprentice chat group on Instagram that, that I've been talking to her about as well today. And that is that um, for anyone who is an apprentice, whether they're in the first year or not, there are and always have been some quite low rates of pay for apprentices, certainly in year one. And that's kind of expected because you know, most of the time you are going to be learning from the start. You're not necessarily going to be overly capable and competent. But at the moment, so as of today, I think first year apprentices and anyone under 18, the rate of pay is £5.8 an hour. That doesn't mean you will get paid that. Some employers will pay more because they're nice. Others won't. But that's the legal minimum is 5 28 As of Monday, Bank Holiday Monday, the 1st of April, 2024, the national minimum wage for an apprentice goes up to £6.40. So that's £1.32, I think. That's a big that. old rise, isn't it? And that's not an April Fool. This is genuine. So although it's the 1st of April, it's going up yeah. a big old chunk. It is. And it also means that all of the others will go. So once you're out of your first year and over 18, then the other rates are increasing. And they're increasing by... Uh, similar so a poundish so they're going up they're going it's on the website you know if Mark i'll drop a link in the description it, for anyone who yeah. wants to go off and check it out for the actual rates but that's really good news isn't it because salary is always a, a complaint amongst apprentices and, and i get it as an employer when you are taking someone on fresh especially out of school it's not so much in your your case max you've got the life skills and you're going to be good to go largely but there is an element of work needed for some of those younger people and the trade-off is with the salary while you go through that phase but yeah i think there has to be a change doesn't there and this seems like a good one to me and six pound 40 it is an extra cost burden on employers but it's not the biggest pill to swallow so fair play yeah yeah and it just it just makes it that little bit more attractive doesn't it you know um Adam and, I, Adam and I chat every now and then when we're driving to jobs, you know, we'll go to Mackey's in the morning, they're advertising, you know, £11, £12 an hour. And you think loads of the kids will go, well, I don't want to be a spark because I can't afford 
five, six pound an hour. I want 11. But what they don't realise is that out of year, you know, out of year one, if you're over 21, it's 11.44 an hour while you're an apprentice. You know, get out of being an apprentice, get qualified. What are you talking? Starting wage for a spark now is about 35, isn't it? Something like that. Easily, yeah. I mean, the salary prospects are just going one way for the minute. And and I've yeah. seen it in Apprentice one-to-one where people have done exactly as you've said. They've gone off to work at McDonald's or Lidl or wherever for an instant salary increase. And no disrespect yeah. to those vocations. But if you want to be an electrician, the, the lower wages at the start are just the start. It goes one way after that. You do just have to see it through. Yeah. Yeah, and there is, there is a company that's advertising in our local wholesalers. Um, and whilst it might be, you know, an option too, it's like four, 54 grand, you know, mm. you know, four or five years in an apprenticeship, couple of years learning the job proper when you're actually out on the tools yourself, you know, you're not going to earn that in little, even as a manager, are you? you know, you're talking, you're, you're going to end up stopping at about 25, 28, 30 grand. But yeah. I mean, we see, so, we see the cha- challenges with wages. Well, I think Jamie on the electricians podcast said this more than once around um, some of the energy providers who were recruiting electricians in the, the salaries there are sort of between 35 and 40,000, I think. So as renewables becomes more of a thing, if you are qualified and you're in those spheres, you're going to be in demand, whatever area of industry, because everything's getting electrified, isn't it? So I think the prospects for employment are good. It is just that hard line to walk whilst you get there. And yeah, it all boils down to funding, doesn't it? It's not just the apprentices' wages, the funding of colleges, the funding for employers and We've yeah. seen the failing of option skills that's just happened in the last last week or so. And, and you're right, you look at that 20, 27,000, whatever it is, um, payment, and you wonder how how that can happen, really, at an apprenticeship level, because there is quite a lot of money, isn't it, spread amongst the number of students. And the salaries, you're right, the salary's been offered to lecturers. I see the adverts, and I'm aware of a number of training providers, FE and private, that can't get enough staff to teach. And the other lecturers who were trying to hold the fort in the meantime are massively under the strain, been recruiting for six months to a year, maybe longer in some cases. And I'm not quite yeah. sure why that is the case. Do you have any view on that? I, I, I don't I think it's it's weird because, again, you know, like I said, one of our local colleges is recruiting. Um, but their starting salary for a, a lecturer appears to be about 32. You know, you can get more if you've got an assessor qualification and the rest of it, but... You know, if you're coming out as a out of your apprenticeship, you know, first year qualified spark with three two nine one, all the rest of it, that sort of, you're probably talking about thirty five. Mm. Why would you then go? Yeah, mate, I'll go and sit in a in, in a college full of kids that want to go home at three o'clock, don't really want to learn. Um, when I could be out there, you know, let's be honest, a lot of the time getting stuck into something where someone said, I've got a fault with this board or I've got a fault with this item or I've got to get in there. That mental challenge of working out, that's what people go to work for. That's where you, you know, just to deal with a group of 15 people that are sitting in a class that don't seem to want to be there, I think would be really disheartening. Um, but even when they're short term, you know, this this advert was, was for four weeks. So it was like 30 up to £39 an hour, which actually is a good rate. Mm. But that's like start tomorrow. And how many decent sparks can go, oh, let me look at my calendar that's not booked out for, you know, less than six months. I mean, you're probably working to dates in 2025 now, aren't you, with, with your business? We are working quite a way into the distant future. I've been having a few discussions with Matty and Nathan about their holiday booking to try and get some sort of planning in the business because we are yeah. so far ahead and it, it's difficult at that level when you are wanting people to have holidays but also have a business that can plan and survive but yeah we are we're busy and it's the same for most people out in industry at the minute yeah so to be able to drop that or reschedule your bookings or whatever to be able to go and do sort of four weeks at that that high rate and i imagine actually that'll be a we'll pay you up to 39 pound but then you sit down for an interview and oh, I press the wrong button and it'll be, yeah, yeah, but you haven't got an assessor call, so we can't give you that. We can't give you that. So actually, it's going to be £25 an hour, at which point everyone's like, well, I, I won't bother. But but then it also doesn't say, does that £39 an hour include you now having to do lesson prep for four weeks' worth of lessons? Which, if you've never done it, and, and again, I think I've spoken about this in the past, it's very different 
from sitting and talking to people, you know, this is this is quite challenging talking to you and, and, and interacting like that. To then talking to your friends or talking to a customer, it's massively different from standing up in front of 15 people that you are supposed to impart knowledge to and get it right and not, you know, not offend anyone, which is really difficult at this day and age, you know, not say something you shouldn't do, you know. Um, it, it's hard. It's a hard thing to do, technical training and delivery. It's not an easy job, and the salary should reflect that, damn straight it should. Um, it's, it's how that problem is overcome, though, because it just seems to be getting worse, not better. And the whole the whole mess with option skills now, if you look at um, TESP's latest article today on it, there's 580 students they've had get in touch with EAL who are collating like a list of people who have been affected and they're kind of the gas and electrical areas largely. I think it's mainly electrical. I don't know if you know, but Option Skills had a couple of centres in London, one in Manchester and one in Birmingham. So that's 580 people so far who filled this form in. There's probably loads more who don't even know about it who are searching through for the information. Um, and they're saying they're going to work with Ofqual to come to some sort of resolution and that it'll take time working with a training uh, providers and such to see what they can do. But I'm wondering exactly what they can do. They're saying that there's no access to any of the stuff that they've been uploading with option skills and all that's maybe no longer accessible and the training that they've done might not be able to be carried forwards. They're advising people to screenshot as much as they can. It just seems like an absolute mess. Um, and I don't know how the funding for that is allocated if it's all drawn up front. So when you're a training provider, if you can just take the full allocation of funding and you know, it's all gone. A lot of these people who've been affected are um, paying for that training. So they're on finance agreements as well. So it's yeah. really, really messy. Um, and just to re-emphasize TESP's current advice is do not sign up with another training provider at present. Fill mm -hmm. the forms in that EAL have put forward. It's just a few basic contact details. And then get in touch with the liquidator, which is Begby's tra uh, Trainer Corporate. And again, I'll drop links to all of those things in the description of this video. But I don't know if you have any experience of that, Matt, based on your prior work history or a view on it. I think um, I would imagine that most of the funding is done certainly as an agreement up front, so that it's there. I mean, I know, um, like I said, my, my employer has just paid the whole lot up front to the college. So um, I would imagine everyone would do that. I think the government funding is supposed to be drawn down over a period, so on a on a regular basis. So an employer will do generally five percent, unless they're a big employer, at which point there'll be a levy fund which they've paid into as a, as a tax. So then it will all come out of their levy fund, and that will be drawn down in in periods. But um, just doing some bag paper maths, five hundred and eighty apprentices on electrical installation at twenty grand each is eleven and a half million pounds. Eleven and a half million pounds. Wow. So if you're <laughs> pulling that down for four, five, six years, whatever it might be. Again, how can you not pay your staff decent wages to get decent, decent staff? You know, where's that all gone? And I'm going to do a Jamie now, and I'm going to say allegedly, having spoken to people in the training sphere, it would appear that allegedly a lot of colleges use apprentices to shore up the rest of their college. You know, 11 grand, 11 and a half grand coming into a college is a big chunk of money to use across the college. Whether that's true or not, I can't prove it but it wouldn't surprise me and um, so i don't know with option skills what they were using that fund for but absolutely yeah, yeah, don't sign up with anyone else they they should you know that data should be theirs they should be able to access it so i don't know what's happening with option skills maybe offqual can get them to release the data that they've, they've uploaded and submitted and um, i'm surprised if there's a cloud portal that that's been shut it's maybe the administrators who've come in and just kind of blanket close things down while they get a handle on what's going on and it will be accessible. This is just I'm a handful of learners. I think probably about 30 or so said yeah. to me through Apprentice One to One that they can't get access to the stuff <laughs> and they're desperately digging through their emails and, and pictures on the phones and word yeah. files and stuff that they've written away along, alongside their more official study routes just to get copies of that. So yeah, it's it's not easy. Most of them seem to have spent between sort of seven and ten thousand pounds, I'd say, for their 
packages of training because they're kind of packaging stuff up with level three alongside a 2391 or whatever or yeah. a level two intro it's not the full apprenticeship thing i don't think or maybe there is some people in that position but generally speaking that's kind of where it seems to sit and because they've done it over finance agreements with a different entity they've still got to pay for those things even though the training's yeah. not been delivered but it's an absolute mess i mean me looking at this as fresh eyes on this particular problem is how can it even ever have existed i don't understand why people are front loading the cost of their training to that level it should surely be paid on monthly installment basis to the training provider why do they need it all up front all at once that doesn't make any sense and if that has to be the case you know why is that not insured like we do with the solar systems where we did that solar job for you matt and we've got the mcs certificate which is an insurance back guarantee for you as the customer why can't a training a trainer have that as well uh, there is the protection of using a credit card so lots of people have already given this advice but just to repeat that if you are paying for your training even if it's just the deposit make sure you use the credit card and then the full balance of everything is covered in some way through that so there is those options it's just an absolute mess it is and i think the the other thing with with those training providers when they're private training providers finance agreements it means you can't use the government funding so when I did my, or started my level three as an evening course, I went through a number of the training providers and, and none of them would take the, the adult learner loan. So there's only okay. one of the local colleges like Stafford College that said they would take it, which means that effectively you then got government backing. So, you know, if it had gone wrong, you've got more chance saying, well, you know, I can't complete this anymore. And they'd look at that and say, well, you, you know, potentially you've had this much training, so you owe this much. So I think that's, to me, that's always a bit of a warning that, you know, you can't access this because they're not, they're not like a learning provider. They're a training provider. It's a very much a private company. Um, and I think there needs to be, there needs to be much more done around this because, you know, there are some really good ones that you hear about and there are some really bad ones that you hear about. And, you know, 580 people, even a couple of grand is still, you know, a considerable amount of money. And and even those just individual people that you know a thousand pound two thousand pound when you are trying to maybe retrain or try to learn a new trade is is just yeah it's shocking it really is I I don't know what Ofqual can do with them not being like a proper college or learning provider or you know proper academic thing it's it's a difficult one they're delivering you know certain regulated courses. But then some of the courses they're probably delivering won't be necessarily regulated. So it's going to be difficult what a government mm -hmm. regulator can do in that sphere. I think it needs to be more about more coverage over what's what's in the scope of Ofsted, Ofqual, ESFA. This needs to be brought much more in so it can be regulated. You know, it can be inspected, it can be checked, and then there can be more. Um, more avenues that, that effect, effectively the government can put in place if a provider goes goes bust, which you know you hope they don't, but unfortunately in this day and age it, it does seem to be an issue, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean from what it looks like, off qual are more pressuring or not pressuring, working with EAL. I say pressuring because they've just fined City and Guilds two hundred thousand quid for an unrelated matter, so they are trying to do stuff but it depends you know what avenues they can press as you've said i don't know the inner workings of how all of that pulls apart and comes together um but yeah it doesn't seem to be helping the learners does it mainly no. lots of this is is set up in a way where the training providers seem to be doing nicely for themselves or certainly that's the impression it looks like based on the figures you can see floating about um, and the ones who are really not is the learners, the trainees, and even the employers to a, a degree as well. I think the whole training mechanism needs a massive readjust in how funding is applied, certainly from yeah. government. When you're looking at your course and experience where you're saying there's lots of younger students there who don't really want to be there. They've just been paid to be there by government funding, aren't they? And, and it's a waste, isn't it? We've got the T-levels now, which are all coming in, and no one's really sure how that all sits in everything either. Um, yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I don't know what the answers are. But to try and encourage employment of apprentices, there has to be some funding for employers. And if the colleges aren't making best use of that funding, because it doesn't look like they are, maybe some of that should be shifted towards that direction.
Yeah, and I think they used to be, and there, there are occasionally incentives, aren't there, that are out there for employers to take on an apprentice. That where you, you know, I think that they, they, in the past they've been anything up to sort of two or three grand a year, um, or two or three grand over the course of the apprenticeship, which isn't bad. You know, it's not it's not bad. It covers maybe your employer contribution and, and a you know a few quid on top. And um, again, even things like that, it was generally only for you know sixteen year olds or sixteen to eighteen year olds. So you know, that then disincentivizes an employer to tell someone like me because I don't get them three grand a year and I might cost them a bit more money and wages. But then, you know, they're, they're, I think there needs to be much more advertising or pushing of the idea of an apprenticeship for anyone. Um, that it can, I mean, again, I was talking to someone in a, in a customer's premises, a commercial premises we were at, chatting to someone there the other day. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm you know, I'm Adam's apprentice. And he was like, Really? Well, you're old. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. But I'm an <laughs> <Charming. should> <laughs> that. I said, absolutely, you know. And, and we were chatting about it, and he's like, I want to be a welder. I'm like, well, go and do it. Go and find a company that will give you an apprenticeship. It's never too late to say, I want to do something different. This is what I want to do. And I want to, you know, and and like you said, you know, I've got, you know, I've been working for 30 odd years. So I know how to get up at five o'clock in the morning and be at Adams when he tells me to be. You know, I've got a driving license and I'm not stupidly expensive to insure on the van. And, you know, I know I use a drill. So you've got these things that make up for not getting an incentive payment. But actually, why not give that employer the incentive, whoever they employ, whatever it might be, just to get the apprenticeship going back again? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And at the minute, it's a thousand pound that they give you anyway for a 16 to 18 year old. In COVID, it was up to... 4,000, which is mm. more more usable. And and damn straight, they should apply that through the whole age range of people who want to go and study to be apprentices. Um, it's all productive taxpayers' money at the end of the day, isn't it? That's what it's all about, getting people into skilled job roles. Um, so, yeah, it makes perfect sense for that. That would be the case. Uh, so, yeah, another thing that needs looking at, off the top yeah. of the rest of all the list of stuff for things that need looking at, I am going to shout out the Test Brogue Trainers um, website, so again, there'll be a link in the description of all of this. And I've done videos to go into this before, but they've got um, some advice of av avoiding rogue trainers. Um, and there's a few key steps. One's to read the small print carefully. And that's just in terms of be being able to qualify for the gold card at the end. You don't necessarily have to go and get it, but the qualifications to attain it. Uh, check whether you're eligible for any funding. So as Matt said, you can get funding even as an adult. It's not a case of having to pay for your training. Uh, check whether you, any of your existing qualifications can be recognised. So RPL in over, as you've done, Matt, with some other study already, some of that might count towards the apprenticeship and you can transfer that across and potentially save some expense. Um, it does happen. Look at reviews and feedback. So again, there's loads of resources on the internet now where you can dig in, even if it's Facebook groups and stuff, and see if there is um, any info on those providers and avoid hard sells. So if someone's coming with a finance agreement saying they can get you signed up on a course and qualified as an electrician in six months, the alarm bells should be ringing because that is too good to be true. Um, and just don't fall for it. There is so many people who get caught out by this in all kinds of different industries, not just our own. So do your research, option skills, what's happened with their learners, you know, that's a massive red flag to lots of people out in industry and training at the minute where you can really cost yourself a lot of money. Uh, it's not just about the qualification at the end. Um, Matt, how do you um, get on with Adam on site? Are you getting on with him well? Is he a good mentor? I know you can't say anything bad about him live on the podcast, but how have you found that that relationship just to delve back into your day-to-day -day life at the minute? No, it's really good. You know, he is... He is time served. He's been doing it 20 years. Um, it's it's weird. I thought it'd be weird, you know, working with someone who's, who's 10 years younger than me, but it's it's great, you know. Um, we have a laugh. We mess about. We talk about all sorts of stuff. We get stuck into various bits and pieces. You know, he gives me that autonomy to go and do stuff that he thinks he knows I'm capable of. Um, he'll challenge me where I'm maybe not as capable and he'll, he'll mentor me on how to do stuff. Um yeah, it's really good. I mean, that's exactly how it should be. What you've described there is exactly how a mentor should behave. And I asked because there's a lot of apprentices who aren't getting that. So we've been giving the, the trainers a bit of a, a bashing on this around all of the funding and everything. But equally, the employers, if you're not providing an environment for people to learn, you are part of that training arrangement. You have to understand and recognize that. 
and put the time into the the learners because I get so many people getting in touch here saying I've not had any experience testing I've not had any experience doing anything beyond putting containment up or whatever and that isn't what an apprenticeship is you know you need like what you've got there Matt yeah and and you know I've said it before and, and again in my previous experience working in you know motor vehicle I, I've met apprentices who have spent four years doing oil and filter changes and that they've got no hope so it's and again is that is that the employer's fault or is that back to the colleges aren't explaining to the employers what they need to do and if you've only got people out and visiting you know twice a twice a year twice a course whatever it might be then you're not going to be picking that up you're not going to be challenging that you're not going to be pushing the apprentice and the employer to, to do stuff um but i think the other thing i would say is Mikey, Mike Page from Residual Current, has been doing a couple of really good shorts lately about his time as an apprentice. And on that, he said, you know, if you're not getting what you need, it's it's for you as an apprentice as well. Move, move on. It's difficult finding apprentices or finding apprenticeships. But if where you are is only giving you containment or only giving you, you know, fetching and carrying cable and stuff like that, and it's not getting you where you need to be, then if you're talk to your employer about it if you can't talk to your colleague about it go find somewhere else i mean i think mike said he's he worked for like five different companies in his apprenticeship and you know look at the spark he is probably because he didn't let that happen you know things weren't working out he wasn't getting the, the industry just you know push 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 get what you can do um so yeah there's, there's quite a few little good snippets coming from mike at the minute yeah, I mean, I'm sure anyone watching this will know who Mike is, but I will drop a link into to a couple of those. I know exactly the ones you're referring to. Um, and he's a prime example of somebody who has, has made it work. You know, it's a difficult yeah. process for people coming into industry as apprentices. Often, you know, you are taken as cheap labour. You will be given lots of the, the menial tasks in bigger companies, in fairness. I mean, in your situation with Adam, it's probably similar to to people working for me and other smaller employers where we do really want to try and see the apprentices succeed and get value from them ourselves as well. Uh, sometimes as an employer, you can fall into the trap of not handing over enough control. It's not on a, taking advantage of someone in terms of labor, but I had this when I was first teaching people in my employment of demonstrating how to do stuff and showing people all the time, but not giving them enough of an opportunity to learn from mistakes because you want your work to be spot on and, and nice for your customers, but equally, there has to be an element of that. And as long as you're doing quality control on it and giving people an opportunity to learn from the mistakes, it's what an apprenticeship is about at the end of the day. You have to stand back a bit and give him a chance. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll give him his dues. He is good at that. He's good at letting me, you know, letting me loose doing my stuff, checking it, you know, making sure it's right, um, pushing me to go and, you know, do something that I've not done before uh, and just being there to maybe sort of sound stuff off. Um, so, yeah. It's, it's working out really well, actually. Is there anything that you've already done in your training so far that you are able to RPL into your apprenticeship? Because you have done bits and pieces, or are you starting from almost ground zero once you do get into September? It's a bit of an odd one, this, and I need to maybe sit down and have a word with my assessor and the manager and the college and stuff. And, and it goes back to what you've been saying about it seems that there are two big providers or big training organisations in electrical. We've got EAL and City and Guilds. And um, I did my level two with EAL and I was kind of told that I could APL a couple of the units across because they're the same. Um, and then I got told not long ago that apparently City and Guilds have said they won't accept them because they're EAL, which is interesting because the City and Guilds website, if you go to 535723, search on Google, City and Guilds 5357, that's the apprenticeship. Um, you can find the centre documents and on there, there is a document in there that talks about what you can APL across. And it also says, you know, from other uh, AOs, other awarding organisations, EAL and guilds, and it mentions the EAL level two and the EAL level three. So guilds are saying they would accept it. The college said they would accept it. And now apparently guilds are saying they won't accept it. So, I mean, it's nothing, it's nothing major. I'm going to have to do the health and safety unit again, which is, boring but i don't understand why i have to do it again if, if there's paperwork on the internet that says i don't need to do it um but i think that's another thing that needs to be sorted out between everything else with you know training and all the rest of it 
the differences between EAL and Guilds, especially now Guilds have bought Trade Skills for You and now Trade Skills for You is now called City and Guilds Training and uses the City and Guilds badge. It's a bad thing in my book. You know, there should be a differentiation between a training provider and an awarding organisation. If that's pushing EAL even further out, mm. yeah. No, that, that didn't seem like a sensible or fair thing to me. And, and we've spoken about it on other podcasts that City and Guilds having a hand in both of those places is a tricky one to bridge quite quite where that came from. Um, I don't know. Obviously, it's a business decision, but yeah, it's yeah. it's it's weird. And there should be a, a join over. I mean, I was asking you because there's a lot of students industry are trying to engage. There's a campaign actually building around those people who have on gone on full time study routes from school and people like yourself, Matt, retraining to try and get them opportunities in employment to do their portfolios. Um, however, there is also a move to try and get other employers to look at them while they're partway through that training and move them into apprenticeships as well, just to try and encourage, you know, a bit of a engagement at that level. And it, it's tricky when the system's not set up in a way where people can transfer around training they've already done. Because the yeah. last thing you want to be doing is doing your health and safety again that you've done, or if you're further down the road, doing your wiring regs again, or your testing inspection modules. You just yeah. want to see it through, don't you? You've done it. It doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah. So, yeah, tricky. And when you think about what is going to be in year one, of an apprenticeship where it is traditionally for 16 to 18 year olds, you know, you're not going to do a lot of anything really. Um, but I, I spoke to trade advisors when we were trying to work out where I was going to go, which provider I was going to sign up with. I spoke to providers who everything from saying I'd be better off actually just go and do my level three privately somewhere else. And then when I've done come back and they'll take me on for two or three years which is weird because why it take three years to do a portfolio um, to other providers that said, no, don't care. You start in year one, day one, you do four years. And, and, and actually that to me is wrong because I've paid for level two. Therefore that has been funded mm. and ESFA rules say you shouldn't fund learning twice. So somewhere there's a disconnect between whether ESFA are funded, ESFA, of checking on just government funding for full-time courses or do they look at things like what someone's paid option skills or you know um excess training or you know any other independent training organization or whether i've paid as an evening course to a college it, it's weird how they can do that and say they're going to charge you know the full whack and do the full four years Whereas I think where I am at the minute is saying they were going to do some, some RPL or APL, but that's maybe a bit limited. But we are looking at the shortness of route that I can do. So I'll probably take two years to do the level three, the day release. But in the meantime, I can build my portfolio. So hopefully by the time I get my level three, my portfolio will be done. My two visits will have been done by the assessor. And I'll be ready for AM two S. So it's one of those things. Yeah, I was I was thinking of the T levels as well because there's a well, supposedly the students should be working with employers more often through the course of those training and maybe exposure to those employers might encourage the transfer over onto an apprenticeship and how all of that might RPL together. It just seems like such a hodgepodge of stuff that needs really whittling down into something that makes sense for people who coming into industry and even more experienced people like you and me who are kind of set to understand this stuff, it's complicated, isn't it? Um, how would yeah. you, I mean, as, as, as a school leaver, you look at it and you think, you know, what what should I do? <laughs> where, where, where do you go? Well, there's no job for me as an apprentice. Do I go full time? Do I go T level? Do I wait it out and just try again next year? Or do I go and work in McDonald's? And all the while you see the industry bodies saying, we need more electricians. There's a skills crisis. There's a massive shortage. And, yeah, it doesn't seem to marry out as true, does it, when you look at it at that level? No, and I, I you know, T levels to me don't make any sense. I've, I've tried to get my head around what it is they're supposed to be delivering, what it is they're actually offering. Um, but it seems like it's the one that we're talking about is a general T level in construction with a little bit of electrical around it, but it's not actually kind of electrical installation. Um, and it's something like 480 hours that you've got to do in with an employer. So it's kind of 
the opposite way around from apprenticeship, which is 80 20, this is 20 80. Um, but I don't think it's useful employer either. I think it's from what I've heard, different, may, might be different colleges, but some of them are, are saying it's got to be done, you know, a couple of days here, a couple of days there. It's not like, well, you've got some holidays, you're going to have this person for six weeks. So it's kind of going to be, from what I've heard from employers, their, their fear is, morning, Matt, it's Monday morning, let's get going, right, Tuesday, thanks very much, six weeks later, morning, Matt, can you remember how to use a drill? No, you can't. Oh, well, got to go back again. So, you know, you, you've not got any continuity of training, you've not got any ability to show anyone anything really involved, and as an employer, you, you're going to be limited for things like, you know, insurance and making sure nothing goes wrong to basically getting this person to do the menial task for a day or two because they won't have maybe remembered it or been able to bring those skills back. And I think the other thing as, a, as an adult retrainee that is majorly messed up by T-levels is most colleges have pulled their level three evening courses because they're not doing the level three full time, which means where I was at the start of this year, um, at Stafford, I pulled out because the provision was that poor, but they'd had about 20 people start and about 10 of them dropped out about the same time as I did. Then they were saying they were going to go back next year, but they're not going to go back next year because I don't think they're going to run it. So that pathway that you had, like me, Dan, you know, other people that have come through that and are doing evening courses, that's going to close because you can't do a T level as an evening, as an evening course. So you're going to lose you know, potentially a lot of people coming through that, that that can't do it any other way. Yeah, I mean, totally. If the if the training providers are tied up delivering T levels, you know, they're not going to put something special on for a limited number of retrainees. If the demand's not there on a on a national basis, so exactly what you've described is clearly happening, and that that's a worry, isn't it? It's not something that's helpful. Um, I I understand. I think why they tried the T levels approach because we were talking about employers and funding and stuff for them and the cost burden of taking on apprentices and there's not enough of them doing it and with t-levels you don't pay for i don't believe um people coming into work for you so there is that that incentive there however from what i've heard from the training providers and the colleges they're having real trouble trying to engage enough employers to want to even do that um i think it would have been way more sensible to just blast apart how the funding set for these colleges on the full-time study routes and allocate more of that directly to employers and incentivize them to take on apprentices i think that would have yeah. been a better way of doing it looking at a very simplistic way i don't understand how these things work at a government level and in education but that seems like it would have been a much better use of everyone's time and money yeah and you know you could you could argue one further and say you know, what, where did this idea that anyone up to the age of 18 must be in full-time education come from? You know, yeah, does that does that hark back to the days of Tony Blair or is it after that? I don't know when the political decision was made on that. Blair and Blair and Brown, I think, were the ones that said everyone must go to university. So now we've got a degree in surfing and all the rest of it, which is, you know, fine if you want to do it, absolutely not a problem. But um, this idea that someone has to be in full-time education, um, is, is where people are then pushed into, same as a motor vehicle, maybe you're not very good at school, maybe you're not overly academic, maybe you should go and be a trades, you know, go and be a spanner, go and be a spanner, go and be a mudslinger, go and be a whatever. Well, you know, you look at what you're doing now with, you know, renewables, you know, you've got your solar, you've got your everything else coming in, all your heat pumps, all of this sort of stuff, you know, top calculations, all of that. You know, you can't just send people that are disinclined to do anything to go and be a trade now you know you need to have that something about you um again you know a lot of colleges are, are saying um you've got to have a level three you, you've got to have your maths to do the level three whereas guilds clearly states there are prerequisites for this course a provider should be supporting an apprentice to get their maths and english and not turning people away because they haven't got it. it, mm. it the, the whole thing is, is you know, it's in the same sort of state as, as what it has been for years, and it doesn't seem to be getting any better. And, and, you know, total kudos for you to try and do what you can to shake the industry up and shake up training and education. 
because it really, really needs it to get apprenticeships and, and trades learning up to up to where it should be. Really does. Yeah, I mean, I always said with Apprentice One to One, we will not compete with training providers and we'll support as best we can from the sidelines. And I do still think that is the best thing for us to do. Having heard what what's happened with option skills though over the last week or two. You know, it felt like the straw that broke the camel's back and we are trying to become an accredited training provider in our own right, not to run apprenticeships as such, um, more to try and help firefight when things like this do kick off. Because at the minute is all I'm really able to do is point people at the advice from test, which is basically saying sit and wait. Um, yeah, and it just felt like the time was now to try and do something. And that's what we're going to do. We are going to press forward and become accredited uh, training providers at apprentice one-to-one -one. um not in a competitive way with others and also because of what you said to me privately matt about all of the red tape and bureaucracy around all of that and that it is an absolute nightmare um it really is just to try and point out what a mess everything is and hopefully inspire a bit of change at that level whether it's the right thing to do or not i don't know it's not the right thing to just sit and watch though that's what i decided Fair play. And, you know, if you can, if there's something you can do to help out, that, you know, that's brilliant. And as I've always said, if there's anything I can do or any, you know, any contacts I can give you or any pointers or any advice or guidance or just doing something, just let me know what it is and, and I'll see what I can do. We'll definitely be picking your brains on this. Uh, I've got Craig as well, who's working away in the background and, and Jamie as well. We're well supported in Apprentice One to One. I've got to thank everyone not just yourself, Matt, there's loads of other people as well who are feeding into all of this. Um, and for those of you who might be listening and you are kind of struggling in your training, there is the Facebook group that that Matt and Dan, who were managing that, I have no real part in it because I don't get on well with Facebook, but you can go and share your experiences in there. There's a community building now, I think, is there 5,000 plus people in there at the minute? I think, Matt, something along those lines. Yeah, there's quite, there's quite a big community in there. And, and I will apologise because, you know, now I'm, now I'm an apprentice, I'm working a lot of hours. And unlike my last job where I could work from home and accidentally be on Facebook for about eight hours a day, <laughs> I'm finding it hard to get there. Um, the only thing I would say with people like that, get on Facebook, on the group, do it on the group. There is a Facebook ninja chat that goes on and gets just people asking for a job. Um, but that's not going to get you a job. Get on the Facebook page itself ask for advice i think mark's pinned some stuff i think i've put some posts up there about how to go about finding it um i will try and do more i'll try and put more stuff on there to try and help people out about you, you, you do plenty good. and you're, bu you're busy enough as it is matt there'll be um some other moderators i'm sure who come forward and, and help in the future as well we are all team apprentice one-to-one -one at the end of the day i massively appreciate what you do over there I just don't have the time to get involved in that. But there is the Apprentice one-to-one -one Instagram account as well. There's a lot of people messaged in regards um, option skills over on there. I think there was a couple of posts in the Facebook group actually as well about people who were students of option skills. Um, and yeah, just to repeat that advice from Tess, go off and, and make sure you fill the form in, make a claim with the liquidator and administrator. And again, there's links in and around all this podcast for you to check, check those um, and do your research don't get drawn back in by somebody else and hopefully it works out for you if you do want to come on this podcast and have a chat about your experiences if you have been affected by option skills or you're just trying to get a start anywhere in industry the door is open to anyone matt's had some success from doing that so i, I don't mind having chats with whoever about their experiences and stuff so please do do reach out is there anything further you want to cover in this episode matt before we draw it to a close I don't think there is, Mark. I think we've we've covered everything. I don't want to get into a I don't want to do a Jamie and get into a rant about the state of FE because I could go for hours and hours and hours having been involved with it for twenty odd years, that sort of thing. Um I yeah, just for those people that are looking for an apprenticeship, just keep plodding on. Do what you can do to learn in the background, get as much experience as you can do. Um don't give up hope because there are come out there that will see see you and pick you up i think you know with the work that's going on in the background with with you know stuff that mark's pushing and other, other people are pushing there there may be improvements there may be changes you know down the line um but yeah it it, it gets there in the end i think is is the message really 
yeah, as, as difficult it is, everyone can have that success in the end. And hopefully you're going to be another example of that, Matt. And full credit to you for going off and, and making it happen. And for anyone who does want to follow Matt's journey, if he is going to start sharing more of it, are you still Sparky by 50 on Instagram or have you changed that handle? No, I, I did have I did have a crisis of if it's going to be three years, do I need to change it to Sparky by 52? But I thought <laughs> I mean, Sparky by 50 is much more catchy. So yeah, it's still Sparky by 50 on Instagram. So that'll be in the description as well for anyone who does want to go off and follow Matt's stuff. And we'll catch up with him again along the way, I'm sure, as well, to see how that's progressing. Thanks for taking the time again, Matt. I massively appreciate it. If anybody does have any questions in and around what we've said on this podcast, please do drop them in below. And otherwise, we'll we'll see you on the next one. Cheers, Mark.